thank you for tuning in again tonight. We have something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. been charged with This is a show where I try to educate real, real stories. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. I'm excited tonight because I have a lady on that I've been trying to get on all year. Her name is Catherine Griffin Grignon. And uh, I'm excited to talk about her. I'm, I'm excited that she's here to tell her story. She's led an exciting life. And now she's doing good things for women who are prostitutes, habitual prostitutes, charged with prostitution in the Harris County Jail. She's developed that program. I also have with me attorney Jim Sullivan. Jim is a criminal defense lawyer that focuses primarily on juvenile law. He's board certified in juvenile law, uh, but he does criminal of any kind, uh, adults and juveniles. So let's get right to it, Kathy. I want you to tell us your story. Who are you? We hear so much about you. You're so famous. Uh, oh tell me who you are. Tell us your story and what brought you from a little girl to be sitting here right now helping people in the Harris County Jail. <laughs> I am a little girl who wanted to be an adult way before my time, just like most people. And then as soon as you get to adulthood, you start saying, they say, how old are you? And you get 22 and you go, oh, I'm 19. Nobody told me that I was going to be an adult for the rest of my life. And I was only <laughs> going to be a teenager and a uh, child for a very short period. So my part in... Where are you from? Uh, born in Inglewood, California, raised in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, came to Houston, Texas at the age of 16 on a scholarship to Texas Southern University. Wow, you were really young. So you yes. advanced uh, growing up in yes. Mississippi. Yes, yes. Um, I advanced so much that my first boyfriend was a professional football player at the age of 14. He was 28, I was 14, and... Uh, I bet your mother didn't know about that. She didn't, when she found out, it like to, she told me it was the saddest day she had ever had since her mother died. Um, and I thought I was grown, because this grown man liked me. At 14, but you're beautiful, so I can and, imagine how you looked at 14. But it was amazing that, that's the fine line there. And I reform prostitutes, human trafficking victims, and theft reform, and people that have been molested or raped or uh, had, you know, that kind of life. travesty in life that, you know, strippers and any of that. And amazing, out of all of the thousands that have I've worked with, most of this dysfunction and this what I call like a demonic seed, almost sexual demonic seed that gets implanted before a male or female child is fully and mentally developed. Uh, if somebody has tampered with them before they're at the age where they understand what real sexuality is and uh, sexual relationships are really about, it starts a uh, system of spiraling downward. Um, because so at 14, you had a 28-year-old boyfriend. Yes, I so did. So that definitely, a uh, football player, pro football player, so that definitely exposed you to a sexual world you should not have known at 14. Should not have known. Because if you had a 16-year-old boyfriend, you would just both be discovering. Even if he'd had sex already, you'd still be discovering. But 28, I mean, he's had a lot of women by then, so he can manipulate you mentally before you even know what's going on. And I, I, I thought that it made me special. And he didn't rape me. He didn't take anything because I wanted him to. Right. But mentally, I was not uh, capable of knowing what right. I wanted. But you couldn't tell me that then. But that planted the seed for all of the things that happened and took place in my life and started the rise to the fall. 
But it didn't stop you from making good grades and graduated oh, from high school. At I was 16. happy. I had a grown man. I was, <laughs> oh, yeah, I was, yeah, you know, because I thought I was okay. Right. So you graduated, but you didn't try to get married or have babies or anything with this grown man. You went on to handle your own life, which is, was very independent of you. Yes. So tell us about uh, college. Uh, were there any pitfalls there? When I got to college, I got raped on campus. Wow. Um, because this the same man had his adult girlfriend and he impregnated her with twins, my heart was crushed. So at this point, I only was interested in athletes. So I would be the girl to go after the athletes, which I became like, uh, like some people just want doctors, some people want lawyers. I wanted just athletes because that's what I knew. And at that, 14, that's what you had. That's what I. So I stuck with what I knew. So did you like them um, when you came to college? Did you only like college athletes? Or did I you married like a pro football player. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Yes, I did. How and, old were you then? Uh, 20, just turning 21. Young, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Was he already a grown man, or was he graduating with you when you were graduating? He was a couple of years older than me. Um, I was an adult then, and so was he. Okay. Um, I didn't love him. I just loved that he was a football player. Wow. And he had gotten drafted. Wow. But what I didn't know is he had a notorious drug habit and an alcohol problem. And um, so that didn't work. So the 80s was the, uh, that would have been eight, early 80s. So that means that's co the cocaine days. So it was but the cocaine. But you know, habit. it started being totally honest. As a child, being the choir director for the choir, and we go on the church trips, we would uh, spike our Hawaiian punch with Bones Farm, Apple Hill, Mad Dog, Muscatel, all that stuff. I and remember those days. Then we could really be singing because we'd be drunk <laughs> as Peter Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, and I have to think about that in the times that we would experiment with marijuana, because marijuana, I don't care what you say, is a gateway drug to especially children. Right. Especially children. Mm -hmm. Now, there are responsible adults now who use marijuana for medicinal purposes. Right. I get that. But as a child, we weren't using it for medicinal purposes. We was using it because it made us eat, and we was giggling, and we was high, and we thought right. that was, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know, I, I, and Jim, I want to let you talk, but you know, this is, this is a call-in show, so someone's calling in. So let us take our first caller. Caller, thank you for calling on so early in the show. Uh, you're on. Caller, you're on. Um, hello. Hello. I just, I just wanted to uh, give some props to Katherine Griffin. Thank you. She is such a wonderful human being. I have, I have a cold, <clears throat> but I have watched her mature from the time that she made this change in her life. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for calling. And how much she loves God and how much she, and how much she wants to help her fellow man. Okay, well, I, I appreciate you calling, and I'm sure Kathy does too. Please keep watching. If you have a question, call us back, okay? Thank you so much. I do. I have one question. Yes, yes. ma'am. And, and talk into the uh, receiver. Don't talk into the phone, because we hear the echo. Okay. All right. What's the okay. question, ma'am? I had one question. I, I wanted to know how did she make the, the turn? When did she determine to make the turn to helping others? We're going to get there. Keep watching. It's an hour show, so keep watching. Now, we're going to get there. We just started off with her life, and we're going to get all the way through. Give us a, a, about, till about 30 minutes. You're going to stay with us for the, the whole hour? Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me let you come on in, Jim. You want to say something? Well, just from listening to your story so far, I mean, as far as the alcohol use that you were talking about, if you're in the South and Tennessee, the kids I knew were using the, you know, the Canadian whiskeys and all kinds of stuff. But I also agree with you as far as the marijuana use. I mean, it is definitely a gateway drug. Uh, even though I, I personally wasn't into drugs, I knew so many people who were. And if it usually start off with weed, and then they want to say, well, let's try and get higher, try some pills, try some... Um, all kinds of stuff. I'm thinking mushrooms, shrooms, um, uh, quaalude. quaalude. Oh yeah, quaalude. Quaalude. Very, very, yeah, quaalude. very, very popular. Very popular, very popular. Molly's Christmas trees. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, and so it, I absolutely agree with you, and then, and that's what I'm. That's when I talk to uh, to juveniles today and, and to my clients. I mean, but to the parents, it's kind of to warn them of just what you're talking about, that it's so addictive. It's and, so addictive. You know. Right. Let's get let's get back onto your story, Kathy. So so you uh, married a football player, and tell us about uh, the rise and the fall. My uh, husband, I was pregnant with my oldest child and I came home and my very best friend was with him. With him? Yeah, with him. Like sexually? It was like with yes, him? So I just turned around and walked out of the apartment and got in my your car. Your best friend when you came home from having a baby was with your husband? I hadn't had the baby yet. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> she was, yeah, she was in my wedding. That was shocking. Yes. Um, and I just got in my car and drove straight to Mississippi to my mom. Hmm. And Where were you living then? Had it, I, I was living in Houston, but okay. I went back home to uh, have your baby have my baby with my mama I know that's right um, and uh, he showed up and he my I didn't realize he was a drug addict and I didn't realize she was too because at this particular time I would dibble and dabble with weed and whatever and even cocaine but I had not become addicted right at this point see my history of addiction I mean, the first time I hit it, I just, you know, I, could, I was still functioning for a decade. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because it was the thing to do. Right. You know, if you weren't doing some cocaine or something, then, you know, you were square. And, right, completely square. And you weren't allowed into the happenings, right. you know. So I didn't think anything was, I thought I was all right. I had no idea. Uh, I left my husband because he was on drugs. He stole money out of my, my parents' home. And, I'll, you know, we confronted him, and that's the day he left. And I haven't, I never saw him again for many, 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 many years. Wow. Um, after that, um, I ended up becoming a part of the music industry. And how did you get in, how did you go from being a, a uh, wife to a football player to becoming in the music industry. How'd that happen? Well, I always wanted to sing, and I played piano and flute and piccolo and percussion, and I did not know at the time that I was adopted and that I come from a very heavy musical family background because the parents that raised me never told me that I was adopted. Really? I always knew, I mean, they were the most wonderful people, but I wasn't like those wonderful people. <laughs> did you look like them? Yes, believe it or not, my father was very dark with cold, wavy hair, and my mother looked Caucasian. Okay, so yeah. you look like you fit in. You, fit in. you, know, you know, back in those days, they fit you in perfect. You know, the, the new generation would say you were like the Harry Potter that was adopted into by the Muggles. Yeah. Being the musician, being adopted by non-musicians. Right. Not, not realizing that, but it's in, it's, in your, it's in your blood, I mean. Right. So. And, <clears throat> you know, I took Italian opera and you name it, classical piano, and, but my mother never wanted me to go into the business. Right. Do you think your adopted mother knew that she you, knew. Her, who your parents were? Yes, they knew. They knew who the father was. Okay. Uh, I was never supposed to find out who the mother is, so I won't call that name. Right. Is, right. I wouldn't do that. Were they, were they trying to keep you out of that? Oh, yes. When they saw me leading that way, I mean, mm. I was with um, Lou Rawls, and we used to do the Lou Rawls mm. Parade of Stars. Um, oh, my God. Johnny Nash. Um, Dr. Jerry Argovitz and Kenny Rogers had, uh, they, they owned the Houston Gamblers football team together and I met Dr. Argovitz because he was my husband's agent, but I was going to be the first middle of the road country western, uh, black, I was going to be the black Charlie Pride female. The, the female Charlie Pride, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, uh, I ended up meeting Rick James. And I got a chance to go on the 80, 80, uh, 1983 Cold-Blooded Tour. Wow, I bet that was fun. And I'll never forget the day that I met him. How'd you meet mm -hmm. Rick James? At, it was called the Stouffer's Hotel at that time. Right here a, on a good friend of mine, Kathy Coleman. Oh, I know Kathy Coleman. Kathy Coleman was dating Rick James's brother, Leroy Johnson. Wow. And she told me that Rick James was doing auditions because at the time, Lakewood Church was the summit. Right, and, and that's where the sofa, that hotel was right by the right summit. next door. So, she set it up for me to go meet him, and I go up to this suite. And he's in this bathroom 
we're actually sitting in this bathroom for hours. And he can't get off the toilet like Elvis Presley or what? Yeah, he was on the toilet, but it wasn't, I mean, he had the lid down. Okay. He was sitting there. And, and I had never seen that before. I knew no what. He was like, how are you going to sit there all this time and not ask me for any of this? I was like, what is that? Wrong question. What was it? Free base? Free base. Okay, so he was in the bathroom on the toilet because he was cooking it? He was smoking, cooking, and he was paranoid. He stayed in the bathroom. Wow. <laughs> was it after a concert or before? And it was before. Okay. Before. Anyway. Um, he said, you're not going to ask me for any of this? So, so and I was like, say, what is that? Can I have some? I didn't say, I never said, man. I was just, what is that? Here. Bam. And, you know, many years later, we talked about that, and he, he cried because... He felt like he introduced it to me, but what he did not know and understand is he did not force me to try it. I have to own up to my part in it. I could have very easily said no. I wasn't raised around all that stuff, uh, even, but my biological father was a drug addict and a notorious alcoholic. When he wrote that. the song, Let's Get It On, I hear people, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, Oh, I got married on that song. I lost my virginity on that song. Let's Get It On is about rehabilitation. Wow. My father, it's the only song he wrote clean and sober in his career. And he was saying, I've been really trying to hold back this feeling for so long. And if you feel like I feel, let's get it on because we're all sensitive people. We've got so much to give. So since we've got to be here, let's live. Meaning, let's stop messing up our lives and let's live clear-headed. And that was his biggest record that, I mean, he, you know, today I own it. I own the song, that catalog, yes. All right, that's Marvin Gaye. You own that song? Yeah, it's Ed Townsend. Ed Townsend, what I'm just saying. He Marvin wrote it. Gaye was the singer. He was the See, singer. See, the writers and the producers own it. get the money. Wow. Don't ever forget that. So your, your daddy mm -hmm. was the writer and the producer? Yes. Oh, wow. And Marvin so co-produced he, he, So that. he eventually owned up to who you were since you were adopted. So I how met did that him happen? in 1986. Wow. And so how did that happen? Um, growing up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, during integration and segregation, that's another reason why I wanted to be grown for so, you know, so quickly. Um, my, I remember the, for colored only, we had to go through the back. So when they integrated, I was a light-skinned little girl with very long pigtails. Mm -hmm. We didn't live in the projects. Uh -huh. um, I didn't ride the school bus. I didn't get free lunch. Uh -huh. um, and if I didn't bring the black children money or candy, they want to beat me up. Uh -huh. And they'd tell me, oh, Kathy Griffin, you white. Oh, uh, you adopted. And I'd go home and say, Mama, why do they keep saying I'm adopted? No, you're not. Look at this birth certificate. Because their parents told them. <laughs> yeah, but they would say, no, you're not. Look at this birth certificate. Me not knowing at that age that there was a sealed one somewhere. Right. So um, my white teachers would tell me that there was a, can I say the word, the N-word? They would say, there's a nigga in the wood pile somewhere. I didn't know what that meant. Now I know what that meant. They meant I was half-breed. Okay. And if I talked to the white kids, then I was an Uncle Tom. Right. So I was, damn if I do, damn if I don't. Right. So I wanted to hurry and just get out of there. Let me graduate early. And what city was that in Mississippi? Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg? Hattiesburg, University of Southern Mississippi. So you yes. wanted to get out of that. I had, let me get out of here. I, you know, and then I, the boyfriend was really, the, old, the older man uh -huh. was my ticket to getting out. Because uh -huh. I knew then, okay, I'm with this old man. My mom was about to kill me. She wanted to kill him. But she's ready to move. Okay, take this scholarship to, to Texas Southern. Let me get you out of here. Right. Well, what that did was, now I'm with all grown kids, and they go to the clubs, and I'm under, and I'm in all the clubs. <laughs> I'm a majorette at TSU. Wow. Oh, my God. I was in radio, television, communications, and theater. Um... Oh, I just had set my I, I set myself up for you having a good time though. Yeah, but I had I was you know I because I thought that's what time it was. Right. And then I was always um, I mean I did not have the word no in my vocabulary. My biggest downfall because I I wanted to please people because as a child I had to pay people not to beat me up. Right. I wanted to pay people to be my friend. I wanted everybody to like me. Right. But I, you know, because I loved people. Right. And why y'all don't love me? I wanted people. to be accepted. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Uh, when I found out that I was adopted, I was 26 years old. Wow. Okay. And finally, somebody told me, and I went to my. How did you find out? Somebody told me that you really were adopted. Go ask your grandfather, and I did. My mother's father. And he said, I thought your mama should have always told you. Right. I went home. I'm excited at this point. More family, because it was just me and my brother Nathan Griffin. Uh, it was just the two of us. And I always wanted 12 kids or a house full, because those big families seemed to be so happy. Right. And, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, I was all excited. And she said, he had no right. She never wanted me to know. So finally, I got her to tell me who my father was. And what's your and father's name? Ed Townsend. Ed Townsend. Okay. And I was, uh, uh, Hubert Laws and I were very good friends. And I knew if anybody would know, I could call him and ask him, well, you know who this Ed Townsend guy uh, is? Is Hubert Laws related to Lou Rawls? Or? No. No. That's, but I've heard of Hubert Laws. My father, believe it or not, produced Lou Rawls' very first album. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, it's crazy. So you went sought out your dad? Yes, I, I called, I, I, Hubert Laws told me how I could reach him. I called him. I'll never forget that day. I said, hello, is this Ed Townsend? He said, yes, who's this? I said, do you remember Dr. Owens? He said, yes, who is this? I said, this is your daughter. Well, who is he Dr. Went, Owens? Dr. Owens was the doctor that delivered me and his other two children. They had planned it so that the doctor that delivered me would keep me and place me with the family because the family that, that raised me, my mother could never have children and she wanted a baby. Here I come available and then I look like them and my, my, my adopted father owned a gas station, and the doctor bought his gas from, from oh, okay. my dad. And I was on the front seat of this car, and, and, and my dad says to the doctor, whose baby's that? He said, yours if you want to. He said, well, let me go call my wife. And she, he said, baby, you got to see She got a big old head. She looked just like you. <laughs> and she said when she walked in and she saw me, bam, she knew that I well, was her. Baby. She said, but if she knew then what she knew now, she'd have put me back on the doorstep. <laughs> she'd have left, left you on that front seat. But everything came... So when, I you, understood told, so when you told Ed, uh, I'm the baby you left at the hospital. He or... says, I've been trying to find you forever. I found out that my biological name was Cherry Gale Townsend, which I had been named after my father's wife. You got to understand, my mother was white, and my father was married and black in 1960. Wow. That and wasn't no work. she can't say who her, mother, her biological mother is. But did he yeah. tell you who it is? He never told me, but did you I ask him, or he just wouldn't say? He always told me he, he couldn't remember. That. And and people kept. But those a family secrets. member told me. And interesting enough, let me just say this: the reason why I don't seek her out is because is she still alive? As far as I know. Okay. And he's dead, right? Yes. Okay. I lost him the year I got sober, oh, ten years goodness. ago. Wow. Yes. Um, the sad part is none of them, the parents that put me through the twenty-one rehabs. Drug rehabs that I went to. I got, a, I got a doctorate degree in rehabology, honey. You went to 21 mm -hmm. rehab? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So when did, so you, 83 is when you met Rick James, so that's when you got on crack, on dope. Yeah, basically. because they called it free base, and I never had no free dope yet. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't no free base in it at all? At all. No, it was some base in it, but it wasn't free. <laughs> so from 83 to 2003? Yes. Wow. Wow. Is it, let me ask you this. That first time that you got high on the uh, coke, was every trip thereafter an attempt to, to match it? Yes, because when I, I'll never forget when I got that first one, I was a whole new person. Just like when I lost my virginity to this grown man. Oh, my God. I've come into myself now. Here I am. Oh, and it never came back. Because that's what, I mean, that's what I understand with drug addiction, not having lived it, but having read about it, having dealt with, you know, clients that have the problems with it, is that that first time you get high on coke, it's like the, the, that's the highest you'll ever that's get. That's the highest you're ever going to get. And you're always trying to get back to it, and you never can get to it because you're, you know, less serotonin, less, less uh, pleasure, you know, in your brain. But it's like more and more and more. And, and uh, you know, by the grace of God, you, you survived all that, which is amazing. A miracle. Yes, it is a miracle uh, because, like I said, um, I mean, I have been, that, 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 that cocaine, as Rick James says, is a powerful drug. That's a powerful That's drug. Powerful it drug. killed him. Powerful mm -hmm. drug. And everything you say that you would never do, trust me, you will do that and some. Okay. And some more. Mm -hmm. And on cocaine and, or for cocaine? For it. For it. So after he got you on it, you became a part of his entourage. Though, yes. Right? Yes. For how long were you in his entourage? 
I was a key witness in his trial when he was uh, accused of kidnapping and burning the girl with the pipe. I was a key witness because he did not kidnap the girl. I brought her there. Wow. And I'll never forget. What we was he were, charged with? He had uh, <laughs> kidnapping, sodomy, oral copulation, rape, sex. Uh, oh, my God. It was, was she 13 children. Was something? No. But he still went to prison, didn't he? That's not why he went to prison. Okay. That's this whole thing. When we, let me just say this. When you're getting high, he was like, go find me a girl, and I don't want just any girl. Don't bring me no street prostitute. Right. So I go to a pimp friend of mine in Hollywood. So y'all in Hollywood? Yeah, we in Hollywood. Y'all living in Hollywood? Yeah. So what does he want a girl for? To get high with, don't nobody want to smoke by themselves. Well, what about you? <coughs> oh, I was going to get paid dope to do this. Okay. Oh, but please. But you get I mean, high with him. I didn't, I, who want to get high with Ricky? Steal all your dope. Okay. No, I didn't. Y'all friends, not, you can't eat. <laughs> yeah, we friends. Right, okay. You know, I, that, that's my partner. We friends. Okay. He'd always accuse me of stealing, and I always tell him I wasn't a thief, but I have to look back at I was a thief. Okay. I used to steal coins out of my dad's can. Every time any of us go in the store and eat them people grapes, we don't pay for it, we don't <laughs> stole something. Mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to learn how to be for real honest about everything. Every little detail. And I got to turn over every rock. Right. Because when you leave some, you're leaving that, that stench and that oh whatever that's stuck in your system. And it's hard to break those habits if you don't face those habits. You got to, it takes time. 30, 60, 90 days does not, you're healed. If you're going to really get some change in your life, you're going to have to really, it doesn't matter if I tell you, if I tell you, I got to tell me. How can I be honest with you? And I don't even know how to be honest with myself because I haven't even met myself yet. Right. You know, a little incident has come up. I have a 501c3. Okay. And because I've been working so hard, I let it lapse. Uh -huh. So I have to get it reinstated. Uh -huh. So everybody needs to know, no donations right now until I get it reinstated. I'm not going to jail. <laughs> and we can't invite commercial transactions, yeah. so we're not going to ask that's for that. That's what I'm saying. I don't want uh, none of that. Right. But I'm just saying, so now I'm, I'm in the process of getting it reinstated, but I'm like, do I even want it reinstated? Because You're so I'm busy doing with the, your program now. Yeah, I'm so busy with what I'm doing. I don't have time for boards and all that stuff. Right. I don't care about that. And when I decide... Let it stay lapsed until you yeah, get, I get this program right. off the ground. And then we can, I'll help you get it reinstated, but we, let's deal with that. But I want people to know, I don't want anybody to say that I'm a 501c3 right, now when I'm that. not anymore. Right, you've let But I, am, I do have a program, and this is what I do. Right. So tell us how you got from, so you, 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 you 20 years of 83 to 2003. Are you with Rick James that whole time? On and off everywhere. I'm, I'm state hopping. State you, hopping. Living with different people? I ended you? up with a wealthy attorney uh, who had the first, one of the big minority contracts. It was called Olean Petroleum. What state was that? Houston, Texas. His name, the attorney was Francis Keating. Okay. And he, uh, Coastal Law gave him a minority contract. And at this particular time, I was managing uh, the Tyler Rose nightclub. Oh, I remember Tyler Rose. Charles Bush. Right on Belfort. Uh -huh. Yes. And, Belford and it was a very, I mean, I made a lot of money in that club. And I met this attorney. Um, and this attorney came in and just showered me with, this is the beginning of this prostitution, y'all. He would shower me with money and, and a man, uh, Beverly Hills. And, and he, all he wanted was his baby. And he was a married man. And he told me that his wife wanted, did not mind because she wasn't going to have another baby for him. He even took me to meet her once. Oh, that was some crazy stuff. That was crazy stuff in the 80s. Oh, my God. The 80s were crazy. Oh, though. my God. But the cra 80s were crazy because money was everywhere and people were doing everything. Everything. And, and minorities had had money and, it, you know, it was a very educated time. Pimping was pimping. pimping. Prostitution was prostitution, drug dealing, gangsters. It was what it was. And the Tyler Rose was a busy place. And... I met this man and he swept me off my feet and I had my second child for him. And he, he really wanted my child to be of light skin and 
fine hair, and she came out your complexion <laughs> and looks like me, and she's very beautiful. I don't care what anybody says. That's my, that's guess, my child. That's your baby. Guess he, I, say, I guess he didn't take the biology class. Where <laughs> matching up parents Match, and yeah, fathers with the, the colors the, and we, saying, well, there's a one in four chance, a one in half right. chance. That we learned that with rabbits, right? How did we learn that at school? With yeah. rabbits, uh, chickens or maybe something? Maybe. Rabbits. I, yeah. I, rabbits. I, I, we learned it with rabbits. Because you know yeah. how rabbits have all those different colors, like a white one, a black one, and right. you kind of mix them yeah. up. And, yeah. And, and by the way, what I was going to ask you a while ago, when you first started talking about, you started then stealing and doing things that you never thought you would do. What I was thinking about was kind of what I, you know, tell the young people is that as you start using drugs, the value system that you grew up with and the, and the values that you had, it's like it just, it just goes, goes diminishes. away. Diminishes. Yeah. Di disappears. Disappears. I mean, you're like turning your back on maybe your church, your religion, your, 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 all your values. And so I, I just want, that, I thought, the fact, I know you're going to talk a lot more about that, but the fact that you brought that up, I thought that was really important just because there's so many young people that, that may think, oh, they admire all these people out there that, you know, driving fancy cars and, and, and living that lifestyle. They're watching tell a lie vision. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Tell a lie vision. It's, it's just, it's a road to ruin. So I, I you know, it's good that you're sharing that. Yeah. So. It's so easy for young people's minds to get tricked by what, because, you know, children, uh, teenagers, we are vision, I mean, visionaries. We, we see stuff and I want. Right. You see a cartoon on TV, I want that toy. I want that movie. I want, I want, you don't even know, but it just, it's being sold right. to you. Right. You know, it's so important. People make recovery so difficult. Well, that's a, that's a powerful yeah. statement. Say that one more time. Because I mean, mm -hmm. I've watched that in the 21 years I've been a criminal lawyer. I agree with that, and our system makes it difficult. But say that again. Recovery has been made so difficult, right? When right. simplicity is always the key, because you didn't just all of a sudden, bam, run into dope and drugs and everything all in one day, and you was just, you know, I got, I, I did two thousand dollars worth of dope in one day. And I drank up two gallons of liquor, and now my life is destroyed. That happened over a period of time. So how do you expect somebody to get it all in? Your brain freezes up, basically. It gets impaired. Yeah. And a lot of those children stop mentally uh, developing from the age that they start, depending on what drug or alcohol it is, cocaine, will impair the brain cells. <coughs> Excuse me. Alcohol can actually kill them. And there are other drugs, like the PCPs that these kids are on, and these pills. And right now, it is devastating to see all of the juveniles that are on kidney dialysis, because they thought it was cute that they take their mama's pills, or they do the Skittles, or you know, they, they smoke some bath salts, or this is some legal marijuana. Mm -hmm. It's all a lie, because advertisement and what about the syrup? Yeah. They're real into that syrup, too. Codeine syrup? That's been on and off for years, but that yeah. will tear your pancreas and your intestines mm -hmm. and everything, your gizzards and everything. <laughs> you don't have gizzards. My, my husband said, we don't have gizzards. But I, that's just what I call it. Right. Tear you up on the inside and you don't know. But they'll say, well, at least I'm not a crackhead. But you look back at somebody like me who was a notorious crackhead, and only by the grace of God did I come out of it, and I still have... I mean, I'm kind of thrown off too, but I still <laughs> but you have your mental faculties. You're but still you know beautiful. What I'm I know, but I don't know how you did it. Twenty years, especially right. with the notorious Rick James, he's dead, been dead for what five years now. Long, yeah. Um, and he was in prison for a long let time. Let me tell you so something. He was clean. I went to so many rehabs because I didn't. I wanted to stop getting high. I did. I just didn't know how. And all those rehabs, and I was reading the books and reading the steps. And one thing I didn't learn to work them, but one thing in recovery that is so important that I want everybody to know. There are no two people just alike. So whatever works for you might not work for you. Right. Y'all eat pizza? Yeah. You, would you give me a piece? And yeah. I could stop breathing highly allergic to cheese. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I eat might kill you. Yeah. What you eat might kill me. Right. So how are we going to have the same wellness plan? And the population that I deal with, which is sex industry, prostitution, human trafficking, theft, and a lot of them, 
as juveniles started prostituting at a young age because some of them were touched and they were threatened. If you tell, right. or you're going to be in trouble, or right. this is just going to be our secret, right. or, I mean, you know the stuff. Can we take a call? Yes, take a call. Thank you, caller. You're on. Uh, yes. Uh, how are you today? Fine. How are you? I'm doing good. Do you have a uh, question? You know, I was a, I was an alcoholic uh, for a lot of years, and I used to. Uh, I, I like what the lady is saying. Um, I was deceived into thinking I needed that. That's a good way of putting it. You were deceived into thinking you needed the alcohol, and how did you recover? Well. Um, I was really forced to recover. Uh, did you go to jail? Yes. That's I did some time. That'll do it. The time, yeah. time on your hands will do it every time. <laughs> if you're ready. If you're mentally <laughs> ready and you have that time to sit down, but you have to still be ready because we know many people go to prison and come mm -hmm. out and go right back to drugs and alcohol. So there was a combination Certainly. of you being incarcerated and you being yeah. ready. Well, you know, while I was there, though, I I did a lot of research on my problem. Mm -hmm. And what was your problem? I was alcoholic. Okay, but some people their problem is some people's root problem is something different, like rape, oh. molested as a young age. You know that that because right. of the pain of whatever you've gone through in your life, you're killing the pain with the alcohol. So some people exactly. have to cure their root problem. Yeah. And that's why what Catherine said is so important. No two people are the same. And one of the things I hated right. about the Harris County Mental Health Program through Jan, Judge Jan Crocker was that she it was a one size fits all. And I used to mm -hmm. work with a lot of court appointed young ladies. Some, if you've been molested, and that's why you're killing the pain, just the regular drug addiction programs are not going to, recovery programs are not going to help. That's why I Because you've got, you've got to deal with the, the, yeah. uh, the feeling of shame. That and is different. You have to yeah. deal with what's, what's, what's hurting you, what's And you know, in, in my particular situation, uh, the root cause, I think, was, see, when I was 11 years old, my mother died. That was it. That would be abandonment. So that would that would be I, yours. Abandonment. Yeah, I was mad at God. It, at I, least I thought I was mad at God. Right. Well, I, we need and to it, have we need to have a program for us. I watched my mother die. At, uh, I was 13, and I was mad at mm -hmm. God. Quit school. Went through the whole thing. And abandonment people have a different issue. They yes. kill the pain for yeah. a different reason. And yeah. it's something that you, even though you talk to preachers, mm -hmm. whoever you talk to, no one understands unless they've gone through that exact experience. Because they're going to tell you. Go to God. Well, God can't hug you at night. They can't defend you in school. They can't come and, and take care of you like a parent can because God uh, is in your soul. You know what? And so mm -hmm. it's a different. It's a different. It's a different situation. I want to say this to, to the young man. Um, even though I had been experimenting with this dope and stuff, mm -hmm. when 19, uh, when I met my dad, mm -hmm. and my adopted parents died on me while I was in this addiction, mm -hmm. then. I really spun out of control because then that abandonment, now that I found out I was adopted and then I was lied to, but I wasn't angry that they lied to me, right. but I had so many different wires crossing and then they was talking about I was bi, tri, high, polar and all, just all kinds of stuff coming at me from yeah. all different angles. Um, and I used that as an excuse. I want to say this to all of us. You know, people that are in recovery are those who claim that they are recovered. I'm telling you, I'm recovered from crack cocaine. I don't care what nobody say. And I ain't going to... Absolutely. Don't, Amen. I, you know, I'm not claiming, hi, I'm Catherine, I'm a recovering... That's I had no crack in 10 years, and as big as my habit, habit was, and if I hit some now, it'd take me out the first hit, clean as I am. Yeah, well, you know, in, in, my, in my particular case, I am so in love with being sober now. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes. you got some good words. I like it. Deceived. I'm so I'm in, in love. love. I'm, I'm in love. You got some good words, sir. I mean, oh, I'm serious. I am. Look, I'm look. Hey, 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 hey. You, 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 you're great. We're going to finish, Kathy. I could live sober. Thank you I never for, did. Thank you for your testimony. But now you can. And listen, this is what I want to tell you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. 
Google me, reach out to me, and I'd love for you to be my guest to tell your Please story. Please come on this we, show. We need you to tell your story, okay? It's good. You know, I was just going to add one thing. Yes, ma'am, and thank y'all. Hold on, listen uh, to uh, Jim. Jim, wants to tell you something. Well, I was just going to add one thing to what y'all were talking about as far as abandonment, because I think mm -hmm. we've all experienced that. I mean, my parents divorced when I was one. Right. And as a, as growing up as a Christian, the difficulty that we have is how can we feel close to a heavenly father when we don't have a biological father Ooh. or Ooh, another, that's another, you better say another, that. Ooh, you better say that figure. again. That's a powerful yeah. statement yeah, that's right powerful. there. That's powerful. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that, that's always the, 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 the disconnect, how, how we can feel close, believe in, feel close to a heavenly father when we don't have a or biological earthly. or earthly father. Exactly. Right. Because when, if you're not raised by your own father, it makes it that much more difficult to have Right. To if you have can't touch connection. a father and reach one, how can you feel close to one that you can't even see? Right. That's in the that's, atmosphere. That's exactly. just a difficult reconcile. Exactly. Reach out to me, sir. Okay, I certainly will. Thank you. Um, when I was talking about simplicity, what, I'm going to ask you all a question. Sure. What's the biggest song ever written in life? It's sung every day. Happy biggest. birthday to you. There you go. Yeah. You thinking. Yeah. He got right on it. Yeah. Simplicity. I was mm -hmm. thinking that, but I was Happy birthday is the biggest song ever written in life. Right. Mm -hmm. Sung every day, simple. every hour. But you know, he's smart. Most people don't get yeah. it for a few minutes. I, don't know, I was thinking of something. I was so thinking about how the Barney song, yeah. I love you. But you know, you're reaching. Because people mm -hmm. want to be loved. And we're reaching. About we're reaching for something, and it's right. right here. Right. If you have a rule, let's just say mm -hmm. inmates and juveniles and, and adults that are incarcerated. They tell you, no trafficking and trading. Let me give you my soup for your milk. Let me give First of all, that is against the rules, right? Right. But, that's but they do it all day that, long. Right, right. They tell you, no sexually acting out. Right. As I call it in my program, one cat to a mat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your program, but because we have 15 minutes. If Let's you get don't to your learn program. how to stop breaking little rules, Right. Then how are you expected to live a productive life when you're so undisciplined to stuff that you think is just stupid? They say, wear your seat belt. Well, that's the law. But we're getting the car sometimes, might not put it on as you got that ding, 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 ding. Right. Like my husband's truck that makes you put it on. Right, right. Just little simpl simplicity. If we keep it simple and take it baby steps. You, you don't come out of the womb and take off and start riding at 10 speed. Right. You have to be trained and taught. The same thing is you've got to be, be retaught how to live in a society without alcohol and drugs and all this other stuff that we've been doing for so long. Well, I was just going to say that 12-step program, uh, if you're going through it and you're actually doing it, you're gonna, your life is going to be transformed. Yes. And you should be able to see that outward change, that transformation, because if you're not changing and if your life is not transformed, then then there's something not there. You're either not following the program, maybe you're still using, but it's it should show, it should manifest itself. It's kind of like, you know, those those of us that go to church, those who are believers, our lives transform so we're more joyful, we're more happy. We stop using drugs and we start doing what we're supposed to, to do, do. And, and interact and, and form friendships and help people out. That's awesome, and that, that also gives you inner joy, and, and, it, and you should be able to see that in people. And let me make this so perfectly not, clear okay. about one thing that I, that's very important with this. Yes, ma'am. Twelve steps, 90 meetings, 90 days, to me is life and death important because mm -hmm. it will at least get you disciplined to understanding what you're doing. People don't go out there and just throw seeds in those fields and make those pretty rolls of corn and stuff. Somebody had to work that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be taught how to work a simple program. Now, after you have learned how to work a simple program, I would say up to four years for me. For somebody to tell me that I was always going to be a drug addict kept me high. Right. So in the big book, I found where it says some of us have recovered. So I want to know why don't you ever see any people that say, okay, I'm Kathy, I'm a recovered addict. Right. And once I started doing that, for me, I've had that no desire. Yeah, that worked But that you. doesn't work. for Some people have to remind themselves every day. Once an addict, but that kept me high. That's why so many rehabs, because I would say, F it. Mm 
They say I'm always be an addict, so I go into treatment, fatten up, and make my family happy, and get out and go smoke me some more dope, because y'all already told me I'm going to always, <laughs> always be, be an addict. A recovering well, a, a addict. Yeah, it's kind of like, well, from what you're talking about, it's kind of like backsliding. Yes. You know, I remember, I went to Baylor, so I've around a lot of a lot of Christian students, and a lot of them joined the church, or a lot of them are believers, but they thought, well, as long as I accept Jesus Christ, everything, so I can backslide, I can part, I can do everything else, because I've been saved. I can be no, you got to work. You, you got to believe. You got to you got to not only work the program, but it's it should manifest itself, and you should, you know, not do all those things. Those are things that you're supposed to be changing from. Those are things that you're supposed to turn your back on. Absolutely. And so yeah, that's kind of like, I kind of thought call. of that, the idea of backsliding. It's almost what you're talking about. I have, uh, great comments. Great comments. Thank you for calling. Thank you for calling Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Turn your, uh, just talk through the, through the microphone. Turn your volume down. Yes. Yeah. I was calling about uh, uh, classes, uh, trying to find out information about how can I find a group uh, to get in. What's your issue? Uh, alcohol. I would like to recommend that you call Houston Recovery Campus. Yes, ma'am. Um, at 4514... Lions, L-Y-O-N-S, yeah. and ask them, um, tell them that you have, you might need to be detoxed, so you might want to go over to Riverside General Hospital on the corner of, of Ennis and Elgin, especially if you don't have the money to pay for detox, and they will detox you there, and if they feel you need further, or you need treatment, they will transfer you from detox over to the uh, main campus, which is Houston Recovery Campus in Fifth Ward on 4514 Lions Avenue, and you can get some help. But sometimes, I don't know how much you drank or how long, but you might go through withdrawals and you would need to be detoxed first. Cocaine, no, it passes through the system within 72 hours. You don't need to be detoxed from cocaine. But alcohol, opiates, those pills, stuff like that, yes. Uh, heroin, stuff like that, yes you would possibly need to be uh, detoxed. And I'll, I, I ask you to call Riverside General Hospital yes, and show up there. Have you ever been to treatment? Uh, yes, ma'am. Have you been to Riverside? No. Okay, well, that might be what, what you need to do, sweetheart. Are you tired? Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Because you, you sound like you you tired has whooped you. Yeah. It sounds like it's whooped you. God bless you, and we'll be praying for you. Okay, call sir? Riverside, sweetie. Call Riverside in the morning. And thank you so much. You're God welcome, dear. Well, you're such an exciting guest that our time is is running near. So tell us, uh, let's use this last uh, ten minutes to talk about your program and how you, what kind of pro. Well, it will take a whole show to talk about how you got it started because I'm sure it took a lot of work yes. and blood, sweat, and tears, baby. And, and I and I commend you and I <laughs> thank you for starting that program. Well, tell us about your program. I everyone knows that I'm an ex cocaine, ex-prostitute, human trafficking survivor. I've been tied up, chained, broken nose, broken bones, ear cut off, face rebuilt. You can look at that broke, crooked arm. All the skin has been peeled. Yo, God, yes. Um, walked around, fed dog food, forced to do things against my will. All in those 20 years you were on dope? Yes. Uh, also, Prostituted from from every level, from being in the a uh, high end uh, call girl, escort service to behind the trash dumpster, rockstituting, doing whatever <laughs> it took to get a rock. Yeah, to get high. It didn't matter. Uh, it did not matter. And all of those treatment facilities that I went to, I wasn't really allowed to address the issues of of the prostitution and the rape and the molestation and the abuse and my heart being broken and the abandonment issues. Uh, and maybe I shouldn't say I wasn't always allowed because I didn't know how to open up to a lot of that stuff. And then when I started my career of going in and out of jail and prison, you know, um, I had to figure out, I don't like this, but I don't know how to stop this. So I had to ask God to help give me a way to turn all that misery into a ministry. And because of this specialized population, 
what it's, it's so dark because it's the sex industry. Right. It's pimps, it's prostitutes, it's Johns, it's all, you know, human traffickers, it's, you know, bouncers and strip joints and pornography and pedophiles and rapists and all of that stuff. It's so dark. How could I make so many people were going through the same things that I had been going through. I had to be able to put it into a perspective where peer to peer, uh -huh. meaning I get you in a room with everybody that's been through almost, you think you're the only one. Right. You, you got secrets you don't want God to know, but he already know. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And once you get to hearing, you be like, oh, well, that, that ain't so bad. I mean, that happened to you, and you think you, yours is the worst. Oh my God, I can't tell anybody. And then you hear something. Oh my goodness. And then you hear something else. Oh my goodness. Now you're comfortable. Okay, so we've been there and done that. Right. And who better to help somebody pull strength from each other instead of pulling life out of the communities, walking up and down streets where children have to go to school? We prostitute and half naked, just terrorizing neighborhoods and communities. How? can this be brought to the attention of us first? Don't worry about what people are gonna say about us. People are gonna talk about us forever. Everybody's not going to like me. Everybody's not going to like you. Everybody's not going to like you. But until I, we learn how to like ourselves and understand anything that we've done from this second on back, I don't care what it is, it's history. You cannot undo what you've done. <coughs> you have right now. And we can plan on whatever time we have left on how if you're really sick and tired, then I have, we got to, I mean, I have to really go in and help you learn to deprogram all of that stink, all of that mess. I look at my program as the colonics. I go in and clean out all the old boo. Wow. Now maybe when they get to a treatment program, I can hear what you're saying. I didn't like school, so why are you giving me assignments all day, all night? I ran away from school because you made me do homework. So I have to keep it real simple right. and almost like literacy. People say, okay, well, they can get out of jail and go to GED. What about if they can't read or know their ABCs? And what if they don't want to mm -hmm. read? And what if they don't want to? Everybody don't want to read. Everybody don't want to read. But right. they, that doesn't mean they don't have something to contribute to society. That's my point. Right, I agree. So I had to design a program that fits individuals and meets you where you are. You might smoke marijuana, but you was a crackhead. Right. But you tell me you in recovery. Right. Okay, I'm in recovery from cocaine, but I'm still smoking this weed right here. Right. Well, I, as a recovery coach, recovery is when you tell me you're in recovery, but now smoking that weed, I don't know nobody in Texas has got a license. So you just call me, Miss Kathy, they just arrested me for some weed, and I'm going to ask you, how'd that work for you? Uh-huh. Okay? So you, it takes steps that you go through. Uh-huh. Everybody just don't get it. Everybody spends all this money to put their people in these fancy treatment. It takes time, it took time for you to get toe up, and it takes a little longer to get untoe up, but you gotta stay focused, and you gotta have room for error. And how long is your pro program, though? In the Harris County Jail, and I'm so grateful to Sheriff Adrian Garcia, and I'm very grateful to uh, the District Attorney, Mike Anderson, and all of the judges and attorneys, um, that they have allowed my program to be a part of the reentry at the Harris County Jail. Um, so who pays you, the county? Yes, as I'm a contract. You're a contract with yeah, the Harris Yeah, under so, the chaplaincy department right now. Oh, the chaplain, okay. So that's um, where they, uh, Adrian Garcia found the money? Yes. Through his chaplain program? Yes. Like the Christian part. Uh, but reentry is a little separate from chaplaincy. Okay. It just happens to be under the chaplaincy department. Okay. Because reentry, you cannot force spirituality right. on people like... People think mm -hmm. God's mad at them. I'm mad at mm -hmm. God. And some people at this point don't want to hear nothing about God. about God. So as a recovery coach, I have to meet you where you are. Right. You might still call body parts what you call them. Right. And under the chaplain's department, well, you can't say those things. Mm -hmm. you, I have to but let you them have to clean. Be free. You have I to got be free. to let everybody in my program be free. Right. And then I teach you how to curve down. And who's to tell me that that is not what God has told me to do? Because mm -hmm. that's my father. You don't know what he told me. I don't know what he told you to do, but I know what he told me to do. Right. Just because you don't believe And we have it, four minutes, yeah. so, but we want to get to a good spot. Well, I'm going to say, 
God has been calling you, been calling me, been calling everybody throughout their lives. Yes. It's just that we've all been resisting throughout our lives. But Absolutely. But the, the call has always been there. We've got the, we, we feel it. We just turn our backs. You know what? That's why I was saying the thing about the nonprofit thing. I ain't worried about the money part. I've been doing this for years for no money. Only by the grace of God that, I, you know, there is a salary attached to what mm -hmm. I do now because I've been doing this for real because God didn't tell me don't worry about how much money I'm going to pay you, but you got to do this. I'm going to be, I'm going to be guilty of mining now because I ran mm -hmm. and he spared me. I came out of that life without any HIV and this, that, and the other. Wow. Even though the, those, I mean, I've been raped more times than you got fingers and toes, guns put into my, all of that. And I'm here. I had to turn that misery into this ministry. And I, I eat, sleep, and drink this right now because this, you know, and I'm the guinea pig for the Star Drug Court, one of the first, mm -hmm. under Judge Caprice Cosper and Mary Covington and uh -huh. Brock Thomas and Mike Wilkinson and, uh -huh. and all of those wonderful, Devin Anderson. You and, were one of them? Yes, first batch. You went through the drug court? Yes. I didn't know that. And I, uh, yes, because I was I facing I, a lot of time. Because I want them it to It saved my life. It was not a get out of jail free program. I had to work. But because they saw fit to help me, and even Judge Susan Brown, because that's who, whose court I was in when I went to prison. Right. And she is proud herself today uh -huh. to see, you know, and I went to her and I said, look what I do now. And, you know, sending me down there, putting on that white, it scared me because I thought we was going to wear white robes in heaven. I said, Lord, can we change the color? <laughs> How but long were you in prison? I did, well, in Texas, I did one year. But if you add up all my time, I've done close to eight years behind bars. California, just... Different places. Yes. Um, I want to say that in the Harris County Sheriff's Department, it is a minimum 90-day, maximum 180. It is not a, I mean, it is... Uh, I keep it very simple in there because we are in jail. Are you the only facilitator? Well, I'm getting some help now. I have but some right other now, recovery. Right now, you're running around. When I see her in court, she's running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Yes, in I, fact, she barely made it tonight because she was at the Harris County Jail. So I go to court with them. I have to screen them to make sure they are a fit for the program. Um, I go back to the jail. I program in the jail. I have to do the paperwork. I have to... That's just a lot. And then I have people calling me. I have stacks of I-60s. And then I'm the host of the prison show. So I deal with, all I deal with is incarceration. Mm -hmm. And I just need a break every now and then. You do, you do. And, she <laughs> and has I a got a wonderful husband. And she has a wonderful husband that she spends no time with because she's always doing stuff for other people. But I'm getting ready to spend time with my husband, honey. And she has a badge on right here in the middle. I just want y'all to know she has a Harris County Sheriff's badge <laughs> on. Y'all think that's some kind of pendant? She has a badge on her clothes. So mm -hmm. when I talk to my ex cons and we say we can't find a job, just look at what Kathy Griffin Grignon has done. She has taken her, her life's history and turned mm -hmm. it into a ministry. Thank God for her. <laughs> Thank God for you. Thank God for Adrian Garcia, the yes. sheriff, that saw fit to employ someone with your background to help those. Everybody who has a prostitute case that's a felony uh, offense now calls her because we want them to try to be rehabbed. So, uh, but they got to be ready. But they got to be ready. That's the whole thing about rehab. You can't order it if people aren't ready for it. We have 30 seconds, Jim. You want to well, say something? I was going to say, your, your life is, is just like... Uh, Vivian was saying, you, you've taken all the pain in your life, and I think God brought you through all that so that you can now give back. So now your ministry and what you're doing is a vocation. Yes. And you're helping other people, and I'm hoping that all these people that you're helping will also see Come that, and, do and the they'll same. want to do the same, exactly. And then that's pretty much how we heal the whole world. And that's why I tell them, it's not my program, it's your program. Exactly. It's exactly. God's program, and He so. can use us, we're just vessels. Uh, so. Well, I just want to wrap it up now and say, uh, Jim, thank you for giving mm -hmm. of your time tonight. Jim will be back with us with a great story on juveniles. Wonderful story. And he has a great personal story that he's going to share with us. Kathy, thank you. I know you're tired. I know you need to go feed your husband and feed yourself. She hadn't even eaten today. Uh, so thank you so much for giving of your time to share with my audience, your audience, our community, where we try to educate people about the criminal justice system, the good things that are going on in the jail, uh, where we try to help people. You know, I financed this program to try to help my community because I want to tell your story. I want us to learn. I want us not to make the, some of the same mistakes that we've all made and know that there's a second chance out there for you. And I want everybody to know that she has never really been given her props like she should because, y'all, she works just as hard, if not harder, than me. And her heart is so big and so giving. 
And it's just an honor to be able to sit on the other side of this oh, table with you. Thank you. I think you are fabulous. I'm so glad I'm really, really getting to know you. Thank and you. And I need more people to get to know you because if you ever run for anything else, we need to make sure that happens. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Thank you for tuning in again tonight. We have something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. But he's been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate